Arcade Heroes. Hi everyone, this is Adam with ArcadeHeroes.com and today this video is going to be a little different than what I've normally done. Uh, generally when it comes to game anniversaries, I've just done a post on the website about it. Uh, but this year, I've decided I'm going to do a little video look at games that are turning a certain age. And so I'm going to do them by those turning 40 years old, 30 years old, 20 years old, and 10 years old. And so this beginning video is going to start with those that are turning 40 years old in 2016. That would be games from 1976. And so uh, with 1976 games, they were very rudimentary by today's standards, or you could say ancient. Uh, the graphics were often single color, uh, lacked a lot of detail, um, or they were black and white. And so by that, they don't look like much, but a lot of those games were very pioneering. They set the ground for the games that would come, and if it wasn't for those games, then who knows where we'd be today. Uh, now, of course, there wasn't a lot of games to choose from, and I'm not going to cover every single game that was released in these years that end in a six, just because that would take far too long. So I'm just going to touch on those that were well-known, gained a name because they did something significant, or uh, had some sort of technological significance to them that might have influenced other games, uh, just things that I guess would be popular. And so with 1976, let's start alphabetically with The Amazing Maze by Midway. Uh, now this was a precursor to a lot of the Labyrinth games that were very popular at the beginning of the 80s thanks to Pac-Man. Uh, this lacked any sort of recognizable character shaped like a pizza, or partially eaten pizza, and uh, or, or ghost characters, anything like that. It was just a straight maze game. But what was interesting about it is that it had an algorithm to produce, it claims, millions of millions of different mazes. Uh, there's also a little dot on the screen that moves around that uh, you have to compete against, where it's the computer controlled, it's a computer controlled character that's getting to the end trying to get to the end before you do. Um, another significant thing about this game is that it had a soundtrack to it, and that was also somewhat rare uh, in those days, in 1975 and 76. Sometimes manufacturers would cheat by using something like a 8-track. Um, in fact, one of the games we'll talk about in a little bit used one of those. But uh, this one had a digital track. It's a bit screechy, uh, not the easiest thing to listen to all the time, but uh, overall this was a fun game and it was a proper maze game. It wasn't the first maze video game done, Atari could probably claim that with Gotcha, although it was a lot more strict as far as following the rules of your typical maze on a paper go. After that we have a series of games which all fall into the same category and it's really difficult to know which one came first. Uh, and that's because documentation, especially on a lot of these small companies that only released a dozen games or so and didn't live on through the rest of the Golden Age, um, it's very spotty or non-existent. And so that's where this is tough to figure out. But we have Barricade by uh, Ramtech. We have Bigfoot Bonkers by Meadows. And you have Blockade by Sega. Now. I believe, from what I, little I've been able to find out, is that Blockade was the first, and that's because it received an award, or best of award, at the MOA, later known as AMOA, uh, 1976 show. And that's just a trade show where manufacturers came together and showed a bunch of different uh, games together, and it had a lot of competition, such as Breakout and some other games that I'll get into. But, um, yeah, that it came out on top, and as you can see, the concept it became a classic concept for a lot of players, and just try and run the other player, computer or human, into your wall. Um, and that, of course, became a major thing in the movie Tron in 1982, but it was 1976 where multiple companies created their concepts which fit into that game style. Uh, Barricade was different in that it supported up to four players, uh, whereas Blockade only did one or two. 
Uh, there was also one called Commotion, which Gremlin did, uh, which I believe supported up to four. And then uh, Bigfoot Bonkers, what was different about that one, it only supported two, but it had some very unique joysticks. And it also had these Bigfoot steps that were put into the play field at random, and so that's what you could use to try and drive your opponent into one of those to kill them. Next up is one that everybody's heard of, and that would be Breakout. Now, of course, this has a history connected to it with Steve Jobs. Um, he wasn't necessarily the uh, sole designer or originator of the concept. It was essentially paid by Atari. Uh, the story goes that Nolan Bushnell or Al Alcorn uh, wanted him to come up with, create this particular concept, which was a variation of Pong, just using as few log logic chips as possible. And of course, Steve Jobs contracted that out to his friend Steve Wozniak, and he stayed with most of the money. Uh, a lot of that history can be found in a number of different books. Uh, Atari Inc. Business is Fun has uh, a bit of writing about that, so I'd suggest that one if you really want to get into the history. But either way, that was a game that really stood out for Atari um, by changing the Pong concept, which was what a lot of games followed at that time. It really caused a stir in the industry, enough that you could say this is kind of the beginning of the golden age of games, where they started to really branch out and try some different concepts. Um, and so Breakout would be followed in later years by games like Super Breakout, or Off the Wall, and many others, Arkanoid, of course. Um, and so it was a huge mover and shaker, I guess you could say, amongst games of 1976. Another one that caused a stir, but in a different way, was a game by Exidy known as Death Race. Just by the title, you can tell where that one's controversy stems from. Uh, in this game, this very simple game, all you do is run people over. I believe they changed it to Gremlins to uh, go against some outcry, but there actually was a news report where it was talking about the violence in video games. Uh, and of course, if you watch it now, it's nothing compared to what we see these days. Uh, you just It is people getting run over, or little stick figurines getting run over, and then they have a little cross to symbolize where they lie, but still, it's very, very tame by today's standards. Um, but still, for uh, one or two players, this game was uh, the initial salvo for violent video games, and so that did turn some heads. Uh, next up is one by Sega called Fawns, and as far as I'm aware, this is the first celebrity tie-in type game. Whether or not Fonzie himself uh, gave this game his blessing is unclear, and that's also because uh, Sega came out with some other games like Motocross and uh, a couple of others which shared the exact same concept, they just didn't have the Fonz attached to it. But even in the f uh, sales flyers for this game, it doesn't use Fonzie himself to promote it so much, so one has to wonder if they actually bothered to uh, get his permission or pay him for that sort of tie-in. I'm inclined to believe that was not the case, as that was very common back in those days uh, when Atari did Shark Jaws in 1975. It was obviously trying to be a Jaws video game, but it was not an officially licensed game. That was just kind of the way the industry went. They put something out there and just hoped nobody would say anything. <laughs> Fonz, it was a motorcycle racing game. The road would curve, and you would just have to navigate it without running into the sides. Uh, this is a game that also used a tape deck or an 8-track for sound, uh, which was just a g gigantic cassette tape. Um, if you're younger, you probably have never seen one before. But uh, that was that game, a, an early motorcycle racing game. is the best way to describe that one. Also in racing was two games that came out uh, pretty much the same time. They were both sh first shown at the MOA 1976 trade show. Uh, there was Night Driver by Atari and there was 280 Zap by Midway. And they played almost 
the same. The main difference between them is that 280 Zap had a heads-up display around it, uh, kind of to mimic a car's dashboard. Um, but Night Driver would become one that most people will get to know, and that is mainly thanks to its console port on the Atari 2600, which was actually very similar, but the uh, console port actually got to be in color. But the arcade port had higher resolution, but overall you just drive through the winding roads, those rectangles represent posts that are being uh, illuminated by your headlights, and you just try and get that as long as you can very basic game again, but it was also one of the very first, if not the first, pair of games that was a first-person driving experience. Um, Night Driver also had a sit-down model with a fiberglass cabinet, nonetheless, that uh, allowed the person to feel a little bit more like they were sitting in a simulation-type game. Um, also by Atari was one whose name is well, really well known, but the game itself, uh, this version of the game itself was not very well known, and that's Outlaw. Now most people know Outlaw from the Atari 2600 port, which has uh, two cowboys uh, facing each other in an arena. Uh, very low resolution as they're very, very blocky and very large on the screen, and they just shoot at each other. With the different game variations, you could have a wagon train moving through the center, or or a wall in between that's moving and you have to shoot away the blocks and then shoot each other or limited ammunition. But the arcade version, what was different about it is it wasn't like that at all actually. It was a lot more like what people would see in western TV shows and movies which were huge in the 70s and that was the fast draw shootout. It was a light gun game. And so a little cowboy character would come out onto the screen and you had to draw your gun out of the game which was holstered inside of the game uh, control panel you have to draw that out and shoot him before he shoots you um, and you couldn't just keep it pointed at the screen so it was a timed twitch gaming sort of concept unfortunately I haven't been able to find any video of this out there um, I do know it was produced, but it does seem to be a fairly rare item to come across. I've never seen one in person, um, and so hopefully I'll come across some video of it uh, at some point, but that one's turning 40 years old this year. Uh, one that was also very, very popular at the time, and not necessarily due to a console port, was a game by Midway called Seawolf. And this was, as far as I'm aware, the first submarine game. Uh, and it was a first person sort of thing, and what was unique about it, or I should say first video game for a submarine, this was actually based on an electromechanical game that Sega did in the 60s called Periscope that Seawolf brought this concept to video and showed where video was superior with the animations and the variety that could be done with that. And so the way that it worked is you looked inside of an actual periscope controller, moved it around to change your view, and you had a trigger on that controller which you could use to fire off your torpedoes and sink enemy ships. And of course mines would appear in front of you to uh, block your shots. And so this proved to be very, very popular. Uh, it was well received by the industry. And actually, in 2008, a company by the name of Coastal Amusements resurrected the concept uh, with Seawolf the Next Mission. And they did three different versions of this game over the years, uh, various screen sizes and whatnot. And unfortunately, they never did an actual full periscope controller that you looked into. They did a periscope-like uh, joystick but just not a viewer for you to look inside of, which was too bad. But it maintained the same concept um, with shooting ships at different depths. Um, this did, was focused a little bit on Ticket Redemption. Another popular game to come from 1976 was Atari Sprint 2. Now, Atari was the originator of the racing video game with Grand Track 10 in 1974. Um, Sprint 2 is similar to Grand Track 20, but it's a lot more fast-paced, a little more detailed. It had things like oil slicks, and uh, the, the cabinet was pretty cool as a monster. But overall, it was a very popular game, and it proved to perform better than Le Mans, which was also released in 1976, uh, or 
there was also Indy 400, Indy 800 that Atari had released. Uh, for whatever reason, Sprint 2 did really well, and Atari did other versions of Sprint. Um, probably the one that people would know the most is Championship Sprint, but uh, we'll get into that in a later video. And also by Atari, they fill up a lot of spots here because they were the 800-pound gorilla that everybody was competing with and producing the most original concepts, especially at this time. And that was Stunt Cycle. And Stunt Cycle was where you would drive your motorcycle along three different levels and try and gain speed so that when you hit the bottom level, you could get over all of the buses or any bigger cars at the bottom. It was basically Evil Knievel, the video game. Very popular back in the 70s. That was the height of his popularity, I believe. Uh, somebody can correct me on that if I'm wrong. But either way, Stunt Cycle was designed to uh, capture that uh, sentiment and bring it to the arcade scene or the video game scene. And as far as I'm aware, I've never seen an exact console port of that, at least not in the early days of the Atari 2600. There might have been something a lot later in the 80s. And then finally, for our 1976 games, there was Tank 8 by Atari. And this took their tank concept, which they'd released in 1974, and beefed it up to eight players. Plus, it had a color screen. And so this allowed it so that all the players could tell which tank they were as you had the blue and green and purple and yellow etc and so if you had that all in black and white and just different shades of gray not referring to anything else there uh, then that would make it a little di more difficult to know which tank you were so the color just worked a lot better and it was a big screen as well a very unique cabinet, very hard to come across. Um, Atari had done an eight-player cabinet in 1975 with Indy 800, uh, but Tank 8, a uh, very cool game, uh, just too bad that it's very, very difficult to come across. As you really don't see too many eight-player games anymore. These days you might with uh, Videmption-type games and the fishing games that are up to eight players, but nothing that's pure skill or strictly competitive-based in that regard. It would be kind of cool to see something like that again. But either way, that's uh, wrapping up 1976 and 40 or games turning 40 years old. Um, I will be getting into those that are turning 30 from 1986 and 20 from 1996 and 10 from 2006, uh, helping you feel extra old in case you haven't already from this video. But uh, thank you for watching and tune into those videos. Uh, they'll be up on my YouTube channel very soon.